p.m. And prayer does work. So what is prayer? It's officially talking to God about what you need, what He's going to do, and what He's going to do through your life. Uh, it works. So write out your prayer requests. If you're online or if you're watching right now, or you've just happened to find our website, fill out a prayer request. You can do that from the online button above on the website and let us know what's going on in your life. Also, once we pray for it, once it's come to fruition, if you'll let us know how it went, what happened, all the details behind it, we'll know if we were able to get part of victory in that. So again, prayer request. Also, we have two champions in our church today. That would be my wife and Jasmine. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, we looked for 100 boxes. We didn't count correctly. We did 97. Uh, so last night when we did the totals again, we thought we had 103. Turns out it was 97. So we have 97 boxes Dean delivered today, correct? Yes. 97 boxes. Also, if you're viewing right now and if you're here in the audience, remember, we, we come to the Gainesville Civic Center for a reason. Currently, we don't have our own building, but when you lease from someone else, it also means they lease this building to other people. Well, it is the season for holidays, and that means that people that have had a lease on this building for 20 or 30 years get to do that first, which means we don't have a home on December 1st or December 15th. So if you're watching, do not show up here at the Gainesville Civic Center in Georgia, Florida, uh, on the 1st of December or the 15th. We won't be here. Uh, we're going to do it through the Holy Spirit. We're not going to tell anybody where we're going to be, and then we're going to let the Holy Spirit tell you where we're going to be. Why am I saying that? If you ever listen to Pastor Rick Renner, uh, in Russia during the communist days, it was illegal to meet for church. So every week, the Holy Spirit would tell the pastor, the pastor would pray, and then the Holy Spirit would tell every member and not one word was ever mentioned. And everybody would know where to show up for church. So, no, we're not going to do that. I'm just kidding. Uh, we're actually going to have something like a home group, uh, very limited people, but we'll still be on the air. Uh, so you can watch us on TV. Uh, so again, Operation Christian Child, 97 boxes, good job. Two people did a great job. I was more of a supervisory role. Uh, I would, every 15 minutes I'd go, y'all are doing a great job. Um, that's the great thing about being a pastor. If anything gets done in a church, it ain't us doing it. Uh, we're the focal head and we're the one in front, but anything that's done in the church, it's everybody else. It's never us. Uh, we get to take some of the credit for it, but trust me, I didn't do anything. Uh, but I think that's it. Uh, also, no, I forgot one. I, I normally forget one. Just read the cards, Tony. Uh, Christmas dinner for our church is on the 15th of December. But the location is going to be announced. Come forth. So if you're watching by video and or live, if you want to dine with us for Christmas, knock yourself out. My wife, the Holy Spirit will not let you know this one. It will be my wife. My wife will let us know where we're going to be dining. All right, before we get started, let's go ahead and open this up in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for us. Thank you for allowing us to have a relationship with you. Thank you for allowing us to be part of something much bigger in the future as far as eternity is concerned. Thank you for looking after our needs, making us important, and making folks understand the day's lesson is really about who they are in Christ. Amen. Okay, I'm going to tell a background story about me today because what did I used to do prior to being a pastor? I was a high school coach. I was a school coach for a long time. But most people don't. Now, what do I normally teach people to do? What have I always talked about in this church? A playbook, right? Why don't we have playbooks? We've got to know what to run, right? It's no different than a journal we have at work. We have people here that have, you know, operations journals at their office. We have kids. What do you get as a, as a high school kid? A syllabus. What do you get at college? A syllabus. Well, my, my, my original intent coming out of high school was three things. Music. I could sing. I couldn't dance. Thank God nobody ever asked me to. I was more of a song man, not a dance man. If I started to dance, people thought I was having a seizure and asked me to stop. Uh, there's a reason why I just stood and sang. Um, and then uh, nuclear engineering. I had a drug and alcohol problem at the time, and the Navy decided to rescind my full scholarship. And then there was fashion school. Uh, I was really good at it. Uh, I wanted to be a designer. Um, my best friend and I had already organized a trip to move to New York City and set out on our fortunes. I actually got accepted to uh, the Institute for Design. So why am I talking about that and a playbook, et cetera, et cetera? Well, so many people want to be on a team or be part of something. They don't know why. Why don't we go to high school in the United States? Because somebody told us we had to. Why don't we join a fraternity when we get to college? We chose to. 
Why do we go to work every day for a paycheck? Somebody said we had to. Why did we choose a career that we really enjoy? We chose to. Why did I want to be a fashion designer? I always like clothes. I was really good at it. I was good at picking out everybody else's stuff. I still am, actually, even though I'm, I'm a behavior consultant, I still take all my clients shopping and I pick out their clothes. I was actually in the haberdashery, what is that? I did custom make clothing for men. Uh, my goal was to design 30s, 40s, and 50s style clothing for men and women, because uh, that's what I wanted to do. And actually, this jacket is one of the finer ones. I still have several custom made pieces in my closet, but uh, when I got sick, we gave away just about everything I had. Uh, so I'm gonna have to actually rebuild my wardrobe. But what's that got to do with anything else? Well. This past week, I, I like to watch documentaries. Am I the only documentary person here? I don't watch regular TV. Uh, I don't like watching commercials and I really don't like sitcoms, etc. So I pick out documentaries. Well, this past week, it was on something called Savile Row. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with Savile Row. It's the place in London where all tailors camp. It's one street. Uh, as a kid, I used to idolize being able to go there. I haven't yet to be there. I've gotten to go many other places, but not there. And uh, if you wanted to make your name in, in tailoring, that's where you went. Well, it's Yankees don't normally get accepted there. You normally have to have a British accent to be taken in, so we always went to New York. But a young kid is doing documentaries on Savile Row right now. Why? Because men have forgotten how to dress. Let's look at, at, at the way we look at church. How many men actually dress up for church now? Oh, pastor included, trust me. Uh, God spoke to me, I have to start dressing up again. Caveat, I have to lose the weight to get back my clothes. I got a closet full of clothes. I just can't get in any of them. So I'll be losing weight periodically. The donuts back there, I won't be touching today. Uh, but what's happened? Why have we relaxed? You know, it's my generation again that seems to ruin everything. We started casual Friday, which turned into Monday through Thursday and Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday. And now when we go to church, what do we wear? I recently went to, uh, I was filming with the guys on a Sunday one time. And I, I watched the church service come out, largest church here in the Atlanta area. And everybody was in a swimming trunks and flip-flops for church. Why would we dress that way if the most important part of our week is church? Would we dress that way for a date when we weren't taking them to the beach? No. What do we normally wear for a job interview? We dress up, why? Because we want them to actually hire us. So what's that got with today's sermon? Well, I was thinking, all right, what does haberdashery and or custom-made clothing have to do with God and our current generation of teenagers? Well, let's look at it. Do most generation of teenagers ever know who they are, where they're going to be, or, or who they should follow? Right now, this group of teenagers is facing the toughest suicide rate, alcohol, drug addiction, and out of wedlock birth rates of anyone in history. Now, granted, uh, we've got more people in the United States than in history. However, it's astronomically high now, why? We don't know who we are, where we're going, or what we're gonna do because nobody ever gave us a playbook for life. I used to ask kids all the time in my class, and I always did this with seniors. This past year, how many times did you guys have dinner at the dinner table? Very few ever said they did. How many times this past year did you, your mom and dad, or you and your mom, or, or we have a lot of single parents now, 50%, sat down and talked real about the rest of your life. What you're gonna do, what you, what you're, how you're gonna do it, how you're gonna pay for it, uh, what's marriage look like, what's, what do children look like, what does your career look like, what are your interests, how you, what do you want out of this? Guess how many told me? Out of every class of 30, 35, I'd always get one. Do we wonder why these kids don't have a playbook or know where they're going? Do we, do we, do we know why kids don't know how to dress or act or anything else? Well, today I'm gonna handle that. Uh, thank you, Kirby Allison, for doing those videos. Uh, you really spurred me on this one, and it gave me a rebirth on, on what I really want to do. Why do I want to go into clothing business? I wanted people to look good. And if you look good, you what? You feel good. Do we always feel good when we lose weight? Yeah, yeah why? Because what's the number one obsession at the beginning of the year? Stop smoking or lose weight. And normally they're hand in hand. A lot of people start smoking to lose weight. It's just easier to not to eat the junk. But if, if we need a playbook for life and we need a direction, and God's our creator, so what's that got to do with clothing? Glad you asked. All right, what we normally say in the clothing business, we have bespoke, we have made to measure, and we have off the rack. Okay. 
Anybody in the clothing business know what this means, but I'm gonna explain it to you guys, because this is also about you. Bespoke means custom tailored. Start to finish, it's handmade. It is hand stitched, every buttonhole, everything that's part of that garment is hand stitched. It's made to measure, it's measured right off your body. Every single dimple in your body, we take into account for what's there. It's used the finest cloth, it's the best thing you're ever gonna see, and it fits like a second skin. It's designed to feel that way. All right, now we have made to measure. About 80% of this garment is handmade. Again, it goes through the same measurement technique. The garment's not as nice because it's not the exact same fabrics, and you do have some machine work. And then this is what 99% of everybody wears off the rack. Do off the rack clothes fit? The mannequin, or if you're a runway model. So how many girls are six feet tall and wear a size zero? Okay, well, we were lucky enough, our son was a model and I was in a room with about 150 of them. It's the only time I've ever seen that many women who look just like that. Uh, and then how many guys really have 3% body fat and they're 6'1"? Um, our son was just what happened to be one of those kids. But if you don't look like that, does anything off the rack really fit? No. Is it designed to fit you perfectly? No. Okay, so now that we understand clothing, let's look at God. God's our creator. Which one do we fit in? Are we bespoke? Are we made to measure? Or are we off the rack? Which one is it? We're charismatic. Just yell it out. Yeah, we're, we're bespoke. Correct. Okay, somebody said made to measure. I just corrected it, just like I did in class. Uh, okay. If somebody threw out the wrong answer when I was a teacher, I just went with what the answer was supposed to be and act like they never spoke. Uh, so, let me get this straight. A tailor is going to spend on average for one garment, let's say it's a three-piece suit, 90 hours for that one garment. The average price of a bespoke tailored suit, sport coat's probably $1,800 to $3,000, and a bespoke suit's about $8,000. Uh, you can get some, some, some in four for in this country, but if you get a Savile Row, about eight grand is going to get you a suit. Is that a good deal for a handmade tailored garment that will last you the rest of your life? Not only that, you'll be able to pass it down at least one, maybe two generations. Is it worth the $8,000? Yes. Okay, so made to measure, you can pass on normally 10 to 15 year range, throw away after one year. Okay. What am I driving at? Well, if God's our creator, and God's a sp sp bespoke creator, then how much time did he put into you? A lot. a lot. So, if God decided to be a bespoke tailor, why did he make us? Do you ever sit around and go, God, why don't you make humans? You were cool without us. Why did you make us? Why did he? He wanted somebody to love. Freddie Mercury's not the only one that needs somebody to love. Um, he wanted someone to love. But then he gave us free will. Why? Because he didn't want to make it a requirement. He wanted us to be able to love him back without being forced. So when I look at kids nowadays, what do most kids feel a loss of? Love. love. Look at Facebook. They can't get away from their phones. You have to actually have something to divert your attention from the fact that you're not a whole human being. We're pretty good at diverting our attention now, aren't we? We go into uh, a restaurant and we've got four kids actually texting each other at the same table. Why? Because there's an emptiness there. It's a whole lot easier to text someone than actually look at somebody eye to eye and get to know them. And then let them see every single thing that you feel as far as pain, right? Okay, so when you go see a tailor, a bespoke tailor, it takes about an hour or two to do all the management measurements. They sit down and talk to you. They want to know what your lifestyle is. What do you do during the week? Where do you work? Who's your wife? What do your kids do? What do you do on the weekends? What does the entire scope of your life look like? Why would that be important for a custom tailor to ask? Yes. So the suit fits your lifestyle, not what they want. You got to remember, a tailor will never have a repeat business when they design a suit for you that's not you. They will only get repeat business if they design a, design a suit for you that works for you. Okay, so made to measure, same thing. They'll sit and spend about the same amount of time, just not the same amount of detail and off the rack. Who's went to a retail store lately? You'd have to set the place on fire to get somebody to help you, right? And then if you actually ask somebody to help you, they get mad at you for interrupting whatever they're doing, whether it's texting on their phone or whatever it is. So if, if that's the case, 
if a bespoke tailor is going to spend 90 hours on your garment, another hour sitting and talking to you, another hour sitting and talking to you, and then you have three to five fittings for every garment you have. So you go in, get the initial measurement, come back in, tweak again, tweak again, tweak again, tweak again. So you spent eight grand on a suit, you've gone at least five meetings, they keep that measurement, and a lot of them hoist it up to the ceiling. You have a paper cut out of everything that, that has been measured on you. So they can always go back to that as a reference. So they always get it right the next time. And if you ever want to reorder something and you haven't gained or lost any weight, it'll fit perfectly. Now, after they give you the garment, for the next years that you own it, you always go back because there's a little tweak here and there, right? Not everybody stays the same size. Who in here is the same size they were 10 years ago? Okay, when I graduated from high school, I weighed 150. I don't weigh 150 pounds anymore. Uh, thank God, because I was a little too light. But you go back and you get it tweaked. Now, let's look at God. If we're going to have a playbook, and we understand, why do we have the playbook? What's the playbook for? Daily life, right? Now, we normally are playing a what when we have a playbook? One of my favorite books is a, a book called The Game of Life. It's actually talking about the quantum physics of how to leave life and, and do it successfully. But we have a playbook so we'll know what to do every day. How many people are successful when they don't write out what they're going to get done the very next day? Well, nobody. Nobody's successful by surprise. It doesn't sneak up on you. So let me get this straight. So we need to know what's going to happen tomorrow, what we want to happen tomorrow to be successful, right? Is, is that right? So if that's true, then we have to assign who's in our world. So, all right, God's our creator, correct? Okay. But who else is here? Lucifer. Okay, where's Lucifer? He's off the rack. Why? Every off-the-rack garment is a copy of a bespoke garment. You go to a Chanel fashion show over in Milan or France or, or Tokyo or New York or wherever it is, Paris, Everybody goes to that show and then goes home and gets something to put on the rack to sell to other people for a percentage of the cost, right? Okay, why do they do that? Because 99% of the population is always going to buy here, not here. 99% of the Christian population will always live over here, not here. Why do we do that? If we all have the same creator, we all have the same measure of faith, we all have the same salvation, we all have the same opportunity, as soon as we receive Jesus, why do both of us live off the rack? Because we never took the time to figure out how to play this game. Now what I'm doing now is it's going to be a series, it's going to be a playbook. I'm writing a playbook for the church because I'm tired of people not knowing how to beat Lucifer. Why do we come to church? Is it to sing songs? Is it to see everybody? Is it to eat donuts? is to see how what hat I'm wearing today. Why do we come? Why do we come? One reason. We come here to win. Again, I always told kids, don't come in this locker room if you're not ready to win. Don't come in my classroom if you're not ready to win. Don't come over to my house if you're not ready to win. My wife can tell you how brutal I am to my clients. Every client I have, I think, cries the first time they come see me because I'm almost just hateful because people lie and people start trying to lie to me and I'm mean to them. My worst client was my own wife. She throws markers at my head. <laughs> was I being mean? No, I was being factual, but it just comes across as mean. If you've ever seen the series Doc Martin, you'll understand that's what I'm like to deal with. I am on the spectrum. Um, but the goal is to win, right? But how many of you guys came to church today with the idea that I was going to win? Or I had to get up early, had to do my hair. I didn't get anything neat day. I hope to have donuts. I don't know why we go to church. I don't even, I'm, I'm thinking about 3,000 other things. I don't know why he didn't call me back. And what was it? What was our, our thought pattern coming to church today? Yeah, same thing I used to ask the kids when they came to school. How many of you guys got up today excited about school on a Monday morning? <laughs> Teenagers? None. That's right. Why do kids not get up excited about school on a Monday morning? Because it's a mandatory activity that they see as pointless and most of their classes are, correct? And they don't understand why they're sitting there and why they're learning what they're learning. That I can honestly say is completely true. Most of public school right now is completely pointless. Public school teacher for over 20 years, I can say that. 
We've made church equally as pointless. Have we not? Why don't we come today? Well, I came to teach you how to win. But why do most people go to church on a Sunday? Mom and Daddy told them they had to. It's a social activity. It's great for business. Uh, I get to see all my friends. I get to sing some cool songs. We're going out to eat after church. How many people actually showed up for a formula to win? Yeah, you always have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What's in it for me and why should I? Why am I doing this activity? Why am I taking my life off the rack instead of allowing the bespoke dealer to give me something custom? All right? All right, so let's go through this. Now that we know I'm writing a playbook for you and hopefully you're taking copious notes, I'm going to tell you how to win. Now you have to approach everything from a longevity standpoint. Is life over when we die? No. No. Blink of an eye, we go into eternity. Eternity is a long time. A lot of people think this is it. It is not. It's just a starter. This is the starter course. This is your appetizer. You're actually using the appetizer to get to the next part of life. But now let's go through, now that we know custom, design, made to measure, and rack, let's look at God. If God is a bespoke dealer of humans, how much time did he put into every single person in this room and over the camera? He knew you before you were born. I'm turn to a uh, scripture here. Everybody turn to Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5. If you're home, go ahead and get your Bible out too, or your phone, whatever it is you use, and look this up with us. Jeremiah 1.5. So many times we don't get it through people's heads that you're an individual design that cannot be copied. Remember, bespoke is one of a kind. can never be replicated. It is one of a kind. Every buttonhole is different. Every piece of, of yarn or, or thread is different. Every single buttonhole may have up to 100 stitches in it. A lot of tailors will actually go back and count those. I used to work for a guy who does. My, butter t my buddy, uh, Travis Giles, one of the best tailors in the United States, happens to be in this area. Uh, so let's look at this. All right, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Because thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So he's talking about Jeremiah. But who else is he talking about? Us. Us. Are we prophets to the nations? We're prophet to our nation. All right, now turn to Luke 12, 7. Luke 12, 7. So he knew you before you were born. He knew you before you were formed in the womb. You were not a surprise. All right, let's go to, to Luke 12, 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. What's he talking about? People do not understand their value. Why is teenage suicide on the rise and rising even higher every day? Well, my generation has done a lousy job of parenting. Outside of that, why else? You don't realize that you're a bespoke model. You don't realize that you're one of a kind. You don't realize that you were created for something very specific. Now, what happens before we get here? What does God do before we actually land here on earth? He whispers into our ear what we're going to do. It's just like the story of Pinocchio. Why did Geppetto make Pinocchio? He wanted a son. How did it work out for him? Not so good, but, you know, again, that's a story. How's it working out for God? Now, keep in mind, what did he do? Well, let's look at this from a meeting standpoint. How many times do you meet with your bespoke tailor? One to five, right? Depends on the tailor and how, how well you fit. And somebody like me, you're looking at at least three visits, okay? But what happens on the first meeting when you meet with God? Does it happen here on earth or does it happen in heaven before you leave? It happens in heaven before you leave. I actually wrote down what, what happens on the first meeting. He whispers in your ear exactly what you're going to do when you get here. Why is that important? He's already told you how valuable you are, what you're going to do, what you're going to mean to society, and what the job is that you're going to do. And then he's going to tell you how great you're going to be at doing it. Right? Okay? So he's trusted you with a mission. He trusted another baby with a mission, didn't he? Jesus. Did Jesus show up on this earth exactly the way you showed up? Is there any difference on how we got here? No, we're all mammals. We all got here the same way. So what was the difference? Why did Jesus accomplish his mission and you're not? Mary and Joseph gave him the playbook. 
They told him why he was here, what his job was, and he, how he had to go do it. And then the Holy Spirit filled in the rest. But the Holy Spirit didn't get to fill in the rest till when? When he went to see his cousin. God dunked. Holy Spirit shows up like a dove, not a dove. You can read it for yourself. It's in all four Gospels. So then God looks at you and he takes your measurements. Our son used to ask me all the time, how tall am I going to be? And I'd say, the height God gave you. The height that God gave you to do the job that you're going to have while you're on earth. I used to get so mad because almost every guy in my family is over six feet tall. I'm not. My grandpa was a great big man. Now I got the shoulders. I just didn't get the height to go with it. So he gave you a specific measurement of what you were going to look like to do the job that he gave you to do. No different than this. A bespoke tailor takes specific measurements. Guess who has those measurements other than you? Why do we take fingerprints of people? It's the only copy. Why don't we look at DNA? It's the only copy. God put that much time into your DNA, your fingerprint, your hair. He knows every single hair on your head. Who counted all the hairs on their head? When our babies come out, do we try to count them? Yeah, I mean, we look at toes and fingers and ears and, and everything. And then we try to count the, the hairs on their head, but can we? No. no. But God took the time to determine every single detail that would go into you. Did he spend more than 90 hours making you? Yeah, he thought about you before he made all of this. Remember, before Genesis 1, you were already thought of. Before Job 37, 38, and 39, when he goes over how the world was formed, you were already considered. The entire plan was already worked out before you got here. Now, if the whole plan's been worked out, and he's put in more than 90 hours to your garment, your garment, largest organ on the body, then why are we not successful? Why do we not know who we are? Why are we not walking in the right direction? Why do we not understand we have an adversary? And why do 99% of us live off the rack lives? Number one problem in high school is what? With programming especially, but what's the number one problem in high school? Everybody wants to fit in. I was a loner. At no time did I ever fit in. Plus, when you see the, the, uh, when you see the documentary in my life, you'll understand why. Uh, it's not normal. Still not normal, but not, not, not like I was. Uh, the post-Jesus guy is way better than the pre. But I was never normal, so I didn't fit in. So I was great for the fashion business. Everybody in the fashion business is strange. Music school. How many normal people do you know in the music business? I was perfect. Now, they don't like engineers who are not in the box. That was more Tony Stark, so that didn't really work out well. But if this is true, and God's given us all these things, and we were made in His image. So imagine, your bespoke tailor is not going to make a suit made for someone else, right? Even though it could be the same fabric, it's still not going to look the same, is it? Here's the difference. Since we were made in His image and His spirit, we have the exact same spirit that created this world. So the exact same spirit that threw the stars into the heavens and created this earth and created everything you see and created everything you will ever see, you have an exact duplicate of that spirit. You were made in his image. Everybody got that, right? A bespoke tailor can use the same fabric for all of us in here, but not one suit will be the same and it will never look the same on each one of us. However, I have the exact same spirit that my Creator has. If I have the exact same spirit my Creator has, can I do the exact same things my Creator does? Absolutely. So now why are we living the 99% off the rack life? When I can come over here and be 1% bespoke and I can live just like my Creator. Isn't that what He whispered in my ear when I was a, when, before I was born? Now what's the one thing that trips us all up? Average human, I've gone over this before on one of my products and I do behavior consulting. The average human has 20 to 70,000 thoughts a day. The average human has anywhere from 800 to 2,000 thoughts an hour. Every single one of those thoughts has to be brought here. I will or I won't, I will or I won't, I will or I won't. Now who governs the thoughts that we think? Our Creator and Lucifer. 
Well, if psychologists are right, you can read this on the internet or any journal, psych journal, the average human has 85% negative thoughts about themselves continuously throughout the day. For teenage girls, it's probably 95%, right? <laughs> if you're honest. Um, if that's true, do we really need a playbook? Yes, we watched football yesterday, okay? Which football and soccer, we watched Premier League soccer. But what do they go over during the week? Every single play they're gonna run, they've already scripted out, they've watched video, they've watched tape, they know what's going to happen. So, why aren't we doing that? Okay, we have the identical spirit that our creator has. Therefore, we have the identical power he has because we were made in his image. And because of what Jesus did at the cross, we have legal power of attorney. What's that mean? My wife has power of attorney over me. When I was six, she took over everything. I don't even know how much money we have. God, if my wife left me, she'd leave me penniless, penniless and destitute. Um, but that's okay. She's not going to do that because she loves me. I'm so wonderful. But since we have power of attorney to live our lives here on earth, that means we have God's absolute power every single day in our lives. But we have to choose which way we're going to go with that. If we're going to be bespoke, we're going to choose to be many gods, or if we're going to choose to live for Lucifer, powerless, penniless, and nothing but fear, doubt, and worry can take over our lives. So let's go over this. Our first meeting, God goes all, all over this with us, right? He's getting to know us. We're getting to know him. He's getting ready to send us on our mission here to earth, okay? No different than when you go see your bespoke tailor. Now, what happens on your second meeting with your bespoke tailor? You put the garment on, it's not finished, your, your buttonholes aren't done, none of that's done, it's just an overall garment, smooth it out, make sure it's good, go ahead and tweak this, 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 and this, and then we send it back to the tailor. Okay, what happens the second time you meet G, uh, uh, God? What's your second meeting with God? Don't yell it out. Yeah, when you receive Jesus, what happens? You were born, you come down on earth, now you have free will, you have to operate with that free will, and you have to make a free decision to follow Christ. Now, once you receive Jesus, what happens? Okay, second meeting, you receive part of him into your DNA now. You got to remember, you were born with his spirit, but you have to authorize it, don't you? It's no different than authorizing a credit card. You can't use it until you authorize it, right? Okay, now you have to authorize his presence in your body. But once he is received into your spirit and your heart, now he's part of your DNA. Now you have legal jurisdiction on this earth to live just like he did. But are you? You're an original. You're not a copy. You're an original that's been developed. Then what's the problem here? Why aren't we doing that? I wrote down what you got off that meeting. All right? You got... Uh, when you get to this meeting, you have to give Jesus the go-ahead to take over your life. Does your life instantaneously change most of the time when you do this? Make sure if you're sitting in the audience today, you're paying attention and not being a distraction to other people. Remember, I used to be a high school teacher, and I will humiliate you while you're here in front of the camera. Trust me. All right, so what do you do once you meet Jesus? What do you do? What's, what's every church do? We send you to a church class. We send you to 12 weeks of this is our church. This is how you get to know Jesus. And then we drop you off and never talk to you again, right? And we expect you to pick up with this, right? If we even do that. But what should happen at this meeting? I figured out that I'm special. I figured out that you made me for a reason. Now, what's the job I got to do now in meeting with you the second time? i got to figure out why am I here. Why am I here? How many people, after they receive Jesus, really have that meeting? How many people in this room had that meeting after they got saved? That's what I thought. Nobody. Very few. We're extreme cases. <laughs> so most don't. Why? We have somebody come forth receive Jesus. What's the second thing we should do after we get salvation locked down? Sit down with them. Yeah, get the Holy Spirit, so that salvation and the Holy Spirit together. Sit down with them and go, all right, now that you have Jesus in your life, let's figure out where you're going with it. But how many of us do that? So we never give them a playbook. We never really tell them what it really means to be a Christian. We don't explain to them that they're a one-of-a-kind bespoke character, so we send them back over here with the 99% to live and let Lucifer control them. 
Because a lot of times we tell people, don't expect anything in this life, only expect it in the next. That's like me going to order, and you have a tailor here in Gainesville that did that. He would actually fix people's suits and forget to take them to them. Uh, it's a funny story, don't want to tell it. Nice guy. Um, so imagine paying the eight grand for the suit, but the guy never brings it back to you. I don't know about you, but eight grand is still a lot of money for me. Now, I, I got friends that are hundreds of millions of dollars rich. Eight grand is still a lot of money to them. So why do we treat Jesus that way? I made you for a specific reason. I'm going to tell you what to do with your life. We're going to have those meetings. We're going to sit down. I'm going to tinker with you. That second thing is to so what? I got to shape you. I got to make sure it, I got to mold it. I got to, I got to make sure that suit fits you. But is that the last meeting we're going to have? No. If I'm going to meet with my bespoke tailor two more times, shouldn't I meet with Jesus a couple more times? But is this the last time a lot of times we meet with him? Yeah. Why? You can look right here. It's our fault. Pastors. It's our fault. Boy, I can blame my generation for just about everything. Um, pastors in general, what do we do? Well, nowadays in the modern day church, we like to preach feel-good messages. How many feel-good messages do I ever preach? Oh, none. I'm not going to. Never going to start. Why? Because if I make you feel good, can you win? How many times did my players ever leave practice feeling good about what they'd just done? How many times did they ever leave halftime feeling good about what they'd done? I don't care if we were up by 45, you'd have thought we were down by 20. Let me pick out all the things we didn't do right. And then one of them was dumb enough to say, but coach, we're up by 45. And then the rest of the team goes, don't do that. There's always something we can improve, right? To a tailor, your garment it's never perfect. I, mean, I know I used to be in the spoke business. There was always something else I could tweak on you. Something else I could make look better. A stitch I could have put in it. Something that could be done. Well, right here, isn't it advantageous for you, if you're going to be here 80, 90, 100 years, to actually figure out what you're going to do, figure out the power that you have, figure out that you're a one-of-a-kind creation, and that you've got a one-of-a-kind job to do. Then why are we waiting and not doing it? Why are we living with Lucifer's life? You gotta remember, when you sit down here, he's gonna give you your vision of your life. He's gonna tell you exactly what your skill set is. Everybody's asked, what, what's my mission in life? How am I gonna spread the gospel? Remember, we've got one job, okay? And if you look through Ephesians, what, Ephesians 5.18, our one job is to know the Holy Spirit, if you look through there. But our job on earth is in Mark 16, 15 through 19, of heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. But we can't do that without Ephesians 5.18 5, because we've got to know the Holy Spirit. So if we've got this, why aren't we doing it? So people always ask me all the time, what's my purpose? I just gave you a purpose. What you're asking me is, what's your career? What's your vocation? What's your way of preaching the gospel? See, not everybody's supposed to be a pastor. Marketplace ministry is where all ministry, for the most part, is done, right? At work stop by whatever convenience store that's marketplace ministry your skill set is what you do great what would you go pro in it's that simple what are you really good at well coming out of high school i was great at math and science i could sing and i was great at creative stuff i, I could create stuff so what i do now that's why i do tv and radio i'm really good at being creative i have an extremely high iq and bad personality to go with it uh, so uh, people like me normally aren't warm and fuzzy, uh, but we're smart and it just uh, doesn't always mix. So what did God tell me to do? Do things that did not include me being with people continuously. I'm not good with people. I'm not good with small talk and I'm rude. All right, so that was great for engineering. How many engineers are really good with people? Oh, they're not. All they do is argue and fight with each other. Same thing with architects, All right? Music, okay, I'm on the stage, but I don't have to interact with you. And then if I'm doing fashion design, I'm still not interacting with you. And in radio, how many people were in there with me? My engineer. And it's TV, how many people were there? It's normally Duke and Terry. All right, that's three people. Again, I'm not interacting with people. And when I'm preaching, am I really interacting with you? No. So God understood who he called and what my weaknesses were and what my strengths were and what I could do. And I was a really good teacher. So he still has me teaching. So I understand that. 
Even though I'm a bespoke human, I have the identical spirit he does. That means I have every single power he has. So imagine being put into an NBA game and you look like you, but you have the skill set of Michael Jordan. And every time you step out there, you have the skill set of Michael Jordan, even though it's you. Why don't you live your life that way if every time you step out of your house, you have the skill set of Jesus? You have the, did, he would never have told you Mark 16, 15 through 19, heal the sick, cast out devils, and preach the gospel if he did not give you the skill set to do it. So why are you living over here in the 99 as if you're powerless? Powerless and you are a copy. Not one person in here or across the airways here is identical looking, unless you're watching Property Brothers, and now I can figure out who they are. Um, although there were two guys I went to high school with, I still can't figure out which one's which. Um, there's not really a duplicate of you. So why are most high school kids right now living like duplicates? If that kid did it, I'll do it. And at my high school, everybody liked to smoke weed, so I went to hard drugs. Everybody liked to drink beer, so I went to alcohol. If everybody was snorting something, I was taking something. I did the opposite of what everybody else did. Everybody had long hair, I had short hair. I didn't want to be like anyone else. I still don't look like anybody else. I can't stand being like other people. I was an individual. Why do we marginalize ourselves now when God told us to go be bespoke? How in the world can you win and have free will if you act like everybody else? What does this get you? Drug addiction, pregnant, uh, unhappiness, fear, doubt, worry, unhappiness every single day, no energy. You get up every day and one day just turns into the next and it's endless and you wonder why you're really here. Is that how you want to live the rest of your life? Can you win like that? How is it that I took over five different teams in my coaching career and won in every single place I went? I never had the best players. I remember being in a state championship. Now, my team, I had all D1 athletes and so did the other team, but her D1 athletes were better than mine. They won, they won by two, I think, at the end. I never started out with the best players. I had to convince them that they were the best players. But did they have skill? Yeah. Did we have enough skill to win a championship? No, the highest I ever got in high school was regional. But golf, regional, always went to the state championship, but we never got there because we didn't have the skill, but we played within who we were, right? You're not always gonna win the championship in what you're doing, but you can be the best of who you are. Because what's our job again? What's our job as Christians? Preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out devils. Just like somebody, I put something about Kanye on, on Facebook this past week. And I just want to say, you know, it's great because he got saved. Okay, check. That's, that was the job. And a thousand people got saved at a, at, a, at a show he did. Okay, so somebody got mad because Kanye was whatever. Okay, and then somebody said something and I let people argue. And I'm like, okay, he, he took the job one seriously. He took the talent. He understands he's bespoke. And he went out and told the world about his second meeting. So he went to his meeting with Jesus. Jesus said, all right, Kanye, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tell everybody about me, what I've done for you, and how your life changed. Okay, I can do that. And so he, he went straight from there and did a show. A thousand people got saved. Okay, he's already ahead of 99% of every Christian in the world because he took the time to actually go to the meeting. He did his homework, and then he went and did what his boss told him to do. And then he went to another one. Same thing. He got a whole women's prison saved the other day. Isn't that his job now? He's using his specific skill set to tell the world about Jesus. Isn't that our job? Because he understands if we're going to win, he has to exercise his free will. He knows what the playbook is, and he knows that he has this now. Something he did not have prior to receiving Christ. Isn't that our job? Now, once we go to the third meeting with our bespoke tailor, is the garment almost finished? And a lot it is, it's complete. Now we put it on you, we make sure it looks good, make sure you're happy before we let you out the door. If there's any tweaks to be done, there's a fourth fitting. At the fourth fitting, normally it's delivered. What have we assured on a bespoke garment? It's only gonna fit you, it's probably only gonna look good on you. Now the key with bespoke is, if you get the right garment, it can last three generations. 
Imagine being able to pass that suit to your grandson that you wore. That's how well made those garments are, if you take care of them. All right, so now let's look at your third meeting with Jesus. Or did you even have a third meeting with Jesus? Do most people have that third meeting with Jesus? No. What do we spend time doing? We're a busy society, right? I'm too busy to meet with the guy who made me. I would rather spend time on my phone, spend time talking to my friends, spend time doing a job I hate, spend time eating food I don't need, spend time wasting time, just filling time to get time. Instead of sitting down and going, from this day forward, this has got to matter because the stopwatch is going. How many people got up today that didn't realize they were going to die? A friend of mine lost his father last night. Uh, I was my uh, elementary school principal. One of the few guys that everybody likes. Everybody's got one guy in town where the, everybody likes the guy. Well, Mr. Mr. Miller, were, golly, Mr. Miller was in his 90s. A great man, uh, went home to be with the Lord. So, I mean, not a lot of tears over this one because he, he got his reward. But how many people can say that they're honored by their community? For, I'm in my mid-50s for 50-some odd years and previous to that. So this guy was a pillar of my hometown for about 70 years. That's amazing. Are you going to be a pillar for your hometown after 70 years? Because now what happens? We've got this here. Now, let's make the measure I've skipped because it doesn't really matter. But if we're a bespoke garment, what's the keys here that I've left out? Now, you've got to get to your third meeting, but what else? A bespoke garment has to have care. Okay, we spend money on clothes, we take care of them, right? My dad was an army guy, so every Sunday morning, my dad would get all of his shoes out and polish them, and he taught me how to do that. And, and every, every Saturday, probably for 20 years, I would polish all my shoes. And then I would line up all my shirts in the same color. I was very structured on every, everything in my closet was. Now that's all gone. Uh, uh, when I got sick, that all disappeared. But, man, to ask my wife, in some ways, that was a good thing because I was a little too structured. But, uh, but it takes care. Spend eight grand on a garment, are you gonna take care of it? $99 suit, are you gonna take a lot of good care of it? No. Eight grand suit, are you gonna take care of it? Yeah, you can buy a car for $8,000. So what kind of care do you need to take of you if you're a bespoke garment? Because do we take care of ourselves? No, what do most people do? I got time. So how do you take care of your garment, of you, of this? How do you take care of it? Every single day, what do you have to do? Stay connected to what? If the Green Lantern has to charge this ring at least once a day on the lantern, shouldn't we charge our ring once a day with our... Because what do you have that he has? If you have the exact same spirit he does... Do you have to reconnect with him on a daily basis to have power? But did you? How do we normally reconnect with our creator? Prayer or we read the love letter he wrote us. People always ask me all the time, what's God's will? Why don't you open this? It's got an index. All you have to do is look up the words you're looking for. Oh, okay, unbelief. Let me go look. He gave it to us. He's not going to spoon-fed it to us. This guy, after he sells you the suit, is he going to make you take care of it? Whose fault is it if this thing gets ruined? Yours. He's going to tell you everything to do, and if you bring it back to him, he'll even press it and steam it for you so it will always look good because that's a reflection of him. Oh, now while we're talking about reflections, if you say you're a Christian and you're born again and you go to a church, you're also a reflection of Jesus. Are you a good one? Or should he fire you as his marketing campaign? Are you making him look good or making him look bad? Right now, would Jesus be ashamed for people to know you're a Christian and you go to this church? I always tell people all the time, hey man, if you're going to make our church look bad, go somewhere else. Just like here. If I caught you doing something stupid and your name happened to be on the back of one of my jerseys, that name wasn't there anymore. I didn't need you that bad. We've had some pretty good players play for us. I didn't have any problem telling somebody, you're no longer welcome. Do you really want Jesus to have to treat you that way? He gave you a job. He gave you his spirit. And he gave you all of his power. All you have to do is take care of that. 
The first stop, stop is to read the Bible. Then you sit down and pray. What is prayer? Talking to God. It's not talking to one of your friends. But we treat God like he's over here. What did I say? He's part of our DNA now. You have the same spirit he does. How did Jesus and Adam talk in the par- in, in, when they walked around the Garden of Eden? They didn't have to use words. When you're that interlocked, it's no different than being married. My wife and I can start out with one word and finish each other's sentences. And a lot of times we actually say identical sayings at the same time. She knows what I'm thinking. I know what she's thinking. So imagine having an omnif- you know, omnipresent being inside of you that knows every thought, feeling that you'll ever have and ever know. And he knows it before you're going to do it. So why do you try to play him and act like he doesn't exist? So you read the love letter he wrote you, you pray. Now what you, you can work out, physically work out, eat right, stop stressing, develop godly relationships. Number one problem right now with teenagers is ungodly relationships. Whether they're being taught in school, anything's okay. Will anything destroy you? Yeah, I tried them all. Did anything destroy me? Yeah, a child out of wedlock as a high school senior. Absolutely, I know how to do that one. I know how to run the playbook of how to mess your life up from A to Z. I did every single bad thing you could even conceivably imagine. I broke all 10 commandments. Took it as a challenge. I was an evil, awful human being. Why? Because I didn't realize that I was unique. I didn't realize I had this in me and I didn't realize that I could have this in my DNA. Because I was all about winning. I was just willing to be a really bad person. I figured if good didn't work, I could really be bad. So I made sure I was a professional bad person. Now, I'm a pastor. God's got a sense of humor. (laughs) Now, also, if you want to take care of this garment, there's a reason why in the 10 suggestions, or the 10, maybe I'll do them, maybe I won't, honor the Sabbath. Why would he tell somebody to honor the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath? Hebrews 4 and 9, actually. Jesus is the Sabbath. And we receive Jesus, we receive that rest. And we receive that Sabbath. But the Sabbath also is a day. There's a reason why uh, Israel, remember we were grafted into Israel, Friday night, sundown, to Saturday night, sundown, or, or you know what I'm talking about, honor the Sabbath. It's a 24-hour period. Why do you have to have 24-hour recharge? Same reason why you have to plug that phone back into the wall. Can we operate seven days a week on full blast? No. What did he tell us to do? Honor the Sabbath. Now, in the United States, for the most part, people think the Sabbath is Sunday. No, that's the day we go to church. Uh, we actually do what, what our ancestors do, and we go Friday night and Saturday uh, in our house. So that means we don't, do any, we don't interact with the outside world for the most part. Uh, we do it the way they told us to do it. But if we're going to be a bespoke garment and we're going to take care of that garment, we have to use the care instructions that God put in the label. Because don't we use the ones that the tailor gave us for the bespoke garment? So why don't we use the ones our tailor gave us? What happens? Don't do what the tailor told me to do with the eight grand suit. It goes, and I just wasted eight grand. Do you really want to tell God that he wasted the money he put into you? Because remember, when you get to heaven, Jesus is your counselor, but Jesus can't stand there on the bema when your judgment comes. I don't mean the great white throne. You've already gotten past that. When your rewards come. Because everything's going to burn up in the fire, and what's left is what you get. And the only person that's going to be able to speak for themselves there is you don't want to be like that when you get there in front of God. Because he's probably not going to ask you any questions. He's just going to see what you did here. Do you really want to go to that meeting unprepared? Because that meeting is going to come. And remember, if care also involves the who? The Holy Spirit. If you have not received the power of the Holy Spirit, what do I mean by that? We're filled with the Holy Spirit when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. We have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit just like he did to have power. Two times. And fill the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus, then you have to receive the Holy Spirit and the power. If you don't have this, can you have power while you're here on earth? No. You have to go back over here and live with the 99% that Lucifer tells what to do. How difficult is this to understand? Because what's our goal again? When? Can we do any of this till we decide to receive Jesus? 
No, now remember, every human is bespoke. But not every human chooses to live for Jesus, do they? No. What's the fastest growing religion right now? All right, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> uh, fastest growing religion right now in China is Christianity. Fastest growing religion in the United States is Islam. See a little disconnect there? All right, so everybody understands the care, right? All right, now let's look at dangers to bespoke counterfeit. Everything that God does, Lucifer counterfeits. Sex was made for a man and woman within marriage. What did Lucifer develop? Everything else. Right? Wine was used in the Old Testament days, New Testament days. What do we do now? What's the number one legal drug in the United States? Alcohol. What's the number one killer right now for traffic accidents? Alcohol. So why do we allow that to happen? Oh, Lucifer did that. Music, schools, all been taken over by Lucifer. Why are we allowed that? We're all bespoke. Why are we allowing Lucifer to control and let us act like the 99%? Why are we doing that? What are the dangers? All right, so Lucifer's going to, I'm just going to read my list here. Advertising to make you look at something else. You bespoke's not that great. You want to do this. Marriage is not that great. This girl over here looks better. Is that true? No. Is the grass greener on the other side? Yeah, a lot of times somebody waters it. That's about the only time. Why do we let that happen? We always stray from what we were designed to be. Why? Because we never sat and looked at who we were, how the playbook should be written, how the game's got to be played, and made a decision to win. If you never make a decision to win, can you? Will you always flounder? Well, you always wonder why you're here. Will you get up every single day worried, afraid, and ready to be destroyed? Absolutely. Now let's look at the dangers to the Christian walk. If we try to counterfeit Christianity, sex out of wedlock, drugs, drinking, lust, we get into God speak. Everybody know what God speak is? I'm too blessed to be depressed. Oh, the Lord's so good to me today. How many of those people have happy lives? Oh, it's, it's, it's a bunch of crap. Hey, let's be real. Let's try being real for once. I've told somebody one time, if you say one more word, I swear I'm going to knock you out. <laughs> say one more word. I, I promise. I'm going to knock you out right here. Because not one thing that came out of your mouth is true. And you're making people that don't understand who Jesus is not want to be part of this team. It's just like bandwagon fans, right? Okay, our team. I, I didn't see you suit up. Hey, next week, you're not going to like the team anyway. Don't we treat Jesus that way? Aren't we bandwagon fans? Well, it's convenient. I'm going to go to church, but nah, I'm not really into that. Hey, man, you go to church? Yeah, but I'm not really into that. Isn't that a danger to being bespoke? And then we have other dangers, low self-esteem. Right now in this country, we have the lowest of self-esteem of any time in history. Why? Because we strayed away from who made us and why we're here. And then we'll tell kids in school, it's okay to be whatever you want to be. I used to do an entire biology class on why you can't be transgender unless you're physically born that way. Now, caveat, I work with people that are both. I work with, with every single person in the world under the sun that can be created through biology. It is, it is amazing to see people who have both. But typically, 99% of the people in the world don't. Whatever you are, when you come out physically from a cell development level, you have to stay. Why? You'll die. Your body is not made to produce one or the other if it was not originally there to start. And I have to send a lot of people to medical doctors to make sure that they don't die early. All right, so what else? Depression. Why are we all so depressed? Every time, I used to, every, somebody walk in every day to my classroom and go, I'm so depressed. Get out. I'm trying to listen to this. Why is everybody depressed? Because if you don't have anything to focus on and you don't know who you are and you're here to win, shouldn't you be? Right now, the highest number of people on psych meds in the history of the world right now. Now, every other commercial during football yesterday was a psych med drug. So we're, telling, we're programming people to be 99%. We're telling people to pick an answer that's not Jesus. And then we as parents are allowing that to happen to our kids because we haven't made the decision to win, right? We fake it till we make it. We like to cheat in life. 
we're so self-centered we can't get past anything and there's absolutely no authenticity about us. We're so busy trying to be like the Joneses, we forget who we were supposed to be. When I was a coach, I spent less time worrying about the other team and more time worrying about us. My thought was, if we get the ball down the floor, we run our offense, we set our screens, we play defense, we get back in on defense, we hit the rebounds, and we run the floor, and we run our lanes, we're going to win. That's true. Just like when Herschel Walker was at Georgia. Everybody knew Herschel was going to run the ball for, for three years. Herschel's going to run. The key is, can you stop him? Every single person in the arena knew Michael Jordan was going to take the ball. Can you stop it? A friend of mine made millions of dollars a year being assigned to guard Michael Jordan. And his number one thing was keep him at 25 points a game. And most people, that'd be a victory. But Michael didn't score 50. So my buddy played in the NBA 15 years for three different teams. And his one job was to guard Michael Jordan. I was like, dude, could you not have found a worse profession? He goes, hey, man, I got paid. Um, so we had something. So when we do that, let's look at the longevity of this. Why do I go bespoke versus rack? Average rack suit asks one year. Average bespoke now, they like to say 10. Most will last 20. Let's look at the gospel for longevity. What is our job as Christians? Okay, heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. Longevity. Well, if I'm going to pass my bespoke outfit to my child and maybe my grandchild, what else do I have to pass? The gospel. I have to pass it to the next generation. Am I? One of the banes of our existence was Little League Baseball. Oh, my gosh. Uh, when I played Little League football, it was actually fun, and our, our coaches were, you know, Back in the days when they kept a bill cooler in the, on the bench or, or in, the lot, in the dugout, but they were good guys and they taught us how to be men and, you know, all that. It really was like the bad news bears. But now it's all about trophies, about feeling good. Uh, everybody has to be treated equal. Uh, and when, we, when our kid played Little League, we would actually sit on the hill so I never had to speak to anybody because I couldn't listen to the parents talk about their kids playing in the majors. They want one kid on our team that they were like they didn't pee in their pants. Uh, but I couldn't take it. And even our kid asked me one time, he goes, so I have a future at this? No, quit, you're terrible. Now most people would never tell their kid the truth. No, it's terrible, quit, please, please, for the love of God, quit so I don't have to go back again. Uh, the happiest day of my life was when he was quitting. But what were we passing to our kids? Well, all I heard the parents do was talk about each other talk about me. Uh, they all cornered me one time because I was such a prick and they didn't want to talk to me anymore. And then the girl wrote me this really bad email and at the time I had never spoken to one person. And then it's funny because the other father who didn't speak to anybody, he's a good friend of ours, he was on the national championship team with Joe Montana who was his roommate in college when he played for Notre Dame. Uh, his name's Lou Pagley, wonderful human being. So me and Lou would sit there and not talk to anybody except to each other. Uh, but he had the same philosophy I did. But what were we relaying to the kids? And now we have wine Thursday night, Friday night, Tuesday night for all the mothers. And now we'll go get drunk and tell our kids not to get drunk. And then we'll want to punish our kids for, for getting drunk, but we're drunk. Trust me, I went home to that every night. I, I've told this story many times. My main job when I got home from high school or from work at night was to clean the poop out of the floor. My mother would poop in the floor every night. I used to tell people that was gravy on the carpet. Now everybody knew I was lying, but my mom would actually throw up all over the wall in the bathroom. So at three or four in the morning when I get home in high school and I get home from work, I'd have to clean the puke up off the floor or whatever else she had left, because mom would be drunk every night and I would have to go on cleanup detail and a lot of times she would lock me out of the house. So I can't tell you how many times I had to kick the door in just to get in. So, and then mom would OD and, and it was a long process here. But that was every single night of me being, what, 16? So imagine that. And people wonder, you know, I, I, used to, I, used to, I slept with a pistol underneath my pillow. So I would actually have it, I would practice being able to pull the gun out from under my pillow in case somebody came in. That was every single night. Was I learning that I was bespoke or was I learning that I was off the rack? Actually, I think I was in the discount bin, right? I wasn't even on the rack anymore. And that's how they conveyed that to me. 
Now, how many kids walked in my classroom with that very same story? A bunch. And what was sad was when I was a kid, that was, you know, that was not the norm. By the time my last year of teaching came, that was 20% of the kids in my class. And we wonder if this is all about longevity and about the next generation. Now, remember in Exodus 26, 26, we're promised to a thousand generations of the gospel being part of our family and the goodness of God and us receiving everything that's in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. But if we don't teach it, can we? If we don't spend time with Jesus, can we? If we don't receive the power of the Holy Spirit, can we? Now remember, parents, actions speak way louder than words. Do words mean anything in the, to this generation? No, they watch every single thing that we do, don't you, teenagers? And you watch to see if we're doing this or if we're living it. How do we know if a tailor's full of crap? <laughs> he gets your suit back and it looks terrible. Now, if it looks terrible, do you write him an $8,000 check? No, gets nothing. But if you get something off the rack and sign, all right, do you take it back normally? No, it's, it's kind of like when you get a meal that's mediocre, but you don't really do anything about it. Um, so let's review here. So part of our playbook, the reason we aren't winning as Christians is we don't know who we are. But once you realize that you're a bespoke garment and you're one of a kind, and you're made precisely to be who you are right now. There was no accident you were born during this time period. You were born during this time period because he needed you here to do your job. And he gave you the specific skill set and looks to do that job. Now, what's it up to you? It's up to free will, but you have to actually go to your second meeting. None of this matters if you don't receive Christ. What's going on in the world today? Why aren't we having impeachment right now? Why is Netanyahu going through the same thing? Not an accident. Lucifer understands that his time's almost up. We have two guys that aren't politicians who are being attacked. They're attacking us along with it. Now, if we don't realize that we're bespoke and we're of the same spirit and of the same mindset, then will we do anything about it? No. So is it time for us to actually understand that we're not off the rack, we don't work for Lucifer, he can control nothing? I know I go back to it every single Sunday, but it's Genesis 126 through 129. He gave us dominion, he gave us the power to subdue. We have a power over every single thing on this earth. Are you exercising your legal right? You have power of attorney, are you using it? If you're not, I'm going to ask you why. Let's look at how I was healed. If you really want to look at this, look at the cell biology, and some of the kids here are in biology now. From the time we're born to the time we die, we have markers in our blood. It will mark every single thing that's ever taken place in our life. Okay, That's how we identify who people are. When I was healed by the Holy Spirit, my markers were completely erased. It was as if I never existed. I had the, I had the blood of a newborn. That is physically impossible. My doctors have told me I'm the first one in history that they have ever seen that happen to. I took it seriously that whose spirit did I have? Is there any way to separate me from him? No. Once I've received him as Lord and Savior, there is no way to separate me. Did Jesus have anything wrong with his blood? They said my blood was so toxic. I had the most toxic blood of any human they'd ever seen that was still alive. And I was closed. But when the Holy Spirit healed me, same thing with my heart. I go in with a damaged heart, I wake up with the heart of a 20-year-old. How is that physically possible? I'm in my mid-50s. But to have every single marker of my blood erased as if I never existed, is that physically possible outside the spiritual realm? No. Now, how do people grow back body parts? Let's look back again. If you're bespoke... And if you'll look this up on the internet, you can recount people that have been to heaven who have died, got a tour, came back. He's got a warehouse of body parts. If you lose one, he's got another one there for you. How do you think people grow back parts? Happens every single day. We've been in camp meetings where it happened. Watch the guy's arm grow, what, a foot? Watch the guy's got arm grow out of the sleeve. Watched eyes be put back in the sockets when there was nothing there. 
One guy, we were watching one, one show, the guy did not have eyes, but he could see. If this is true and we're bespoke, no different. If something happens to the suit, can you take it back to the tailor and they can fix it? Yeah, because they've already got your, your pattern hanging up in the ceiling. They bring it down, redo it. God's got your pattern in heaven. All he has to do is bring it down and redo it. But how do we get it there? We have something that we have to operate in, and it's called faith. You either believe it or you don't. It's no different than going on a date, getting married. They either love you or you don't. You are either in or you're out. The problem is in our society, we can't figure out if we're in or out. We're always in between. Tomorrow I'll be in, Tuesday I'll be out, Wednesday I'll be back in, Thursday, I'm not really sure. How many people live in, I'm not really sure life? And they wonder why you have to live the 99% life and why you're broke, unhappy, in debt, never, ever, 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 ever seem to achieve anything. Why do we do that? What, why is it so hard to go, I'm bespoke, he picked me, I'm perfect the way I was made this way, and I have to grow with him daily because if I do, I can win. The problem is we never decided where the goalposts were. The great thing about football, it's 100 yards. Then you got 10 yards on this side and 10 yards on this side. But in life, we keep moving the goalposts. We never know what the goalpost is. All right, I wanted to get married, but I'm not really sure what marriage is. I wanted this career, but I'm not really sure, so I don't know where the goalpost is. Why, why don't you just pick what the winning score is? What happens if you keep moving your own goalpost? You can't accomplish anything. Here's what I knew as a coach. If our score was larger than their score, when the buzzer rang, we won. Didn't matter what it was. I just knew that I had to be at least one point higher than the other team. Are you really going to let Lucifer pick out what's going to happen to you the rest of your life and make you wear hand-me-down clothing right off the rack that doesn't fit? Or are you going to let God bespoke you your entire life that's custom made that's not like anyone else and everybody walks over and goes, wow, I want to be like you. You know how many people stop me out in public and don't know me and go, who are you? I want to know you. That happens to me every day. Why? Because I radiate the energy of my creator. In a quantum world, we all have a frequency. My frequency is that of Christ. And if that of Christ, it radiates out. And people can feel it. Now, I look different anyway, but the radiating physical part of it, the frequency matches. It's no different when the sirens go off and you can't hear them, but your dog can. They can hear the siren. Now the key is, the decision you've got to make today is, am I going to be off the rack or bespoke? Am I going to take what God has given me or am I going to settle the rest of my life? Which one's it going to be? I used to tell the kids, you quit and practice on me, you'll quit on your wife and your kids and your boss and everything else you do the rest of your life, you'll be a loser and a quitter. If you quit on God, you're going to be a loser and a quitter. You think I'm tough on you? You wait till you stand in front of Him. Because the Creator gave you 66 books to read to see how He was going to qualify that. But the thing is, if you read Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, you get to see what you get in return. Is there anything He won't give you? He doesn't know the word no. He's like a grandparent. Grandparents like to just give. You want chocolate cake six in the morning? Absolutely. How about some ice cream? Want to spend money? Let's go to the mall. That's me. We have some recipients of that here. Since I don't have grandkids of my own, I've adopted them. Imagine being loved. Imagine somebody wanted it more than you. He's just waiting on you to ask for it. Now, can a bespoke tailor make a suit for you till you call him? No. Then you have to tell him what you want. You have to give him specifically what it is you want to wear, how you want to look. Can God do anything for you till you call him? Can he do anything for you till you tell him? Why are you not telling him exactly what you want? Why are you settling to be off the rack? Actually, most of us are in the bargain bin, right? We're already at TJ Maxx. We're in that dollar book. I, my books never made it to dollar, actually. Thank God I, they didn't print enough, but I, I'm not going to say that. But my books have never been at Walmart in a dollar bin. Um, but why do you want to live over here? So today you have to make a decision. 
I'm going to stay here or I'm going to start here. Which one's it going to be? Power comes here. You want to be a loser, jump over there. 99% of the Christian world right now in the United States is right there. You know how many people tell me there's no power in Christianity? I had a mentor this past week say, you don't receive anything here. I'm alive. I don't know about you, but if I have pure blood and my DNA was rewritten, I think I received something. I got a heart of a 20-year-old. I think I received something. I got my sight back. Now, it's a little blurry, but I got it back. I was so sick last Sunday, I could barely stand up, but I preached, didn't I? Because the Holy Spirit got me through it. Is that true or not? How's a psychopath from Huntersville, North Carolina, end up being a pastor in Gainesville, Georgia? I decided to be bespoke. I decided that I would win, and I would come back and teach you guys the playbook. Now, what am I going to be doing over the next several services? I'm writing a playbook for you guys. Since we as pastors have done such a lousy job of teaching people how to win, and most pastors weren't coaches. As you can tell when I started to talk, you can tell I was in a locker room. But why are most motivational speakers coaches? Why does Nick Saban make $75,000 an hour to go speak? He's got six reasons. They're right on his finger. Bill Belichick has six reasons. They're right on his finger. We know how to win. Would you rather follow somebody who knows how to win? I'm the guy that charges the hill in front. I'm not the guy who waits. I might as well just go kill the guy and get it over with. That was my philosophy. That was my dad's philosophy. So are you going to run up the hill or run in the back? Are you going to take the easy way out and have nothing? Or are you going to actually take a chance to be you? Is it difficult to do this in high school? Absolutely. Why? Because everybody wants you to be like them. The cool kids. Life doesn't turn out well for cool kids. If you do a study of all the cool kids in high school, their lives are in shambles 10 years later. I know. Go back to my high school reunion. I was a loner. My life's great. The cool kids' lives never progressed. That was as good as it's ever going to get. But if you're bespoke, you get to rewrite this every single day based on this. So what's it going to be? Now, if you're listening via TV, let me give you a chance to receive Christ. If you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior, now's a good time. Why? Because if you want to be of a spoke and you want to be of one spirit and you want to have his DNA, you got to receive him and you got to ask. So right now is a good time. Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. Save me right now. I want to live for you. Say those words after me. That's the best thing you can do. Also, you've got to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't live this life. Same thing. Holy Spirit, come in me. Come on me. Allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you. Also, if you say these prayers, email me, encounterchrist.org, encounterchrist.org, and let me know that you made this decision for Christ. Also, now, you know, now that we've done this, I've got to take up the tithe. My wife tells me all the time I forget to take up the tithe. All right, if you want to be part of us, why don't we tithe in this church? Protection. Let's go back to Malachi 310, 311. If you bring it to my storehouse, I will give you protection and I will open the windows of heaven. Okay, so if, if I've decided to be bespoke and he's already offered me protection and he's offered me every single way to make money, do I want to jump on that? Do I want to do this halfway? No. So that's why we tithe. All right, if you want to give or be part of this church in giving, or if you just want to give an offering to us, EncounterChrist.org, go up above and go down and giving, and that is self-explanatory. All right, as we exit, is everybody good with the direction we're going here? We're going to learn how to win over the next several weeks. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to walk through every single thing that you're going to face as a Christian and as a person, and I'm going to teach you how to overcome every single piece of it. As a basketball coach, I broke down every single thing that we would face in, in two halves. And I gave them five options on how to beat every single one of them. If I do that for you, God's already done it. I just got to show you what he's already told you what to do. Do you think you can beat Lucifer if I already give you the tools? Because if you know what play Lucifer is going to run, can you run a counter play? Can you win on offense or defense? I know that they like to say defense wins championships. It does not. Offense does. You have to have the ball in your hand. And without the ball, you can't win. 
All right, it sounds great, but it doesn't work that way. If God's given you the ball, don't you want to carry it across the goal line? Okay, so you have to make a decision this week. Do I want to be a loser and be in the discount bin with Lucifer, or do I want to be a bespoke and actually take the power of Christ? Is this a hard decision? How many of you guys will actually make it this week? One. One person in this room and one person listening by camera will make that decision. One. Bruce Wilkinson, the prayer of Jabez. Bruce does a, a talk. Bruce is the reason we got married. Long story. Um, Bruce tells, he will go into every room and he'll go, one person in here will make the decision today. One. Doesn't matter how many people are in there. One person will make this decision. Because everybody else wants to be over here. Because being unique and being bespoke takes work, takes dedication, takes focus, and takes a playbook to do it. Are you willing to do what it takes to be bespoke? Okay. One person will do it. The rest of you will email me this week and ask me why life's not fair. I have somebody at least five or six emails a week. Why is, life, why is God punishing me? No, your own stupidity punishes you. God doesn't. Remember, all bad comes from? All good comes from? Okay, so God ain't punishing you. The stupid will be punished. Okay, everybody stand up and we'll go ahead and dismiss in prayer. Remember, if you need Jesus, accept him today. No reason to wait. You don't know what tomorrow's bringing, so do it now. Now's a good time if you want to be on the winning team. All right, every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, thank you so much for being part of our lives. Thank you for making us unique and specific for the exact tasks that you have for us while we're on earth and for the tasks that we have in eternity. Thank you so much for giving us the talent and the, and the Holy Spirit to be able to do these things. Now, if someone in our audience now, either here or over the camera, is sick, let us pray for them. Lord, heal those bodies. You guarantee us in Isaiah 53, 5, that you went to the cross to take everything from us so we didn't have to deal with it, and we receive that now. We also receive all the power and all the joy. And we get rid of the fear and the doubt that Lucifer has given to us. And now we ask for this week that everybody in this congregation makes the decision to be bespoke, be unique, and to live for you. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. We will see you next week, and we'll pick back up on developing your personal playbook. We'll see you next week.